The year is 2018 AD. French history is entirely occupied by the historians. Well, not entirely. One small era of indomitable goals still holds out against historical accuracy. And life is not easy for the history professors who garrison the universities of primary sourcium, archaeologium, clichéorum, and propagandum. These Gallic myths fear nothing except maybe me. Now, I can already hear Parisians smugly remark how hypocritical of me it is to talk of Gallic stereotypes after I recently claimed there was no goal, or even that they were very diverse. So isn't it possible these stereotypes fit some? Yes, smart asses, it is possible, but I am focusing on the common image people have of them. Basically, I'm focusing on him, Asterix the Goal. Let's start with their names even, which didn't necessarily stop in X, like Asterix, Obelix, Get a Fix, etc. This belief comes from Vercingetorix, which is actually a title, not a name, meaning King of the Great Warriors. And while some names did end in X, most didn't, such as Brunus, the first commander to sack Rome. Obelix could have never delivered Munios, these tall standing Molonites, considering they were erected in the Neolithic around 2000 BC, or even as early as 6 or 7000 BC. In any case, way before Julius Caesar's conquests, or even the Gauls, who emerged much later, around 500 BC. It's important to remember that by the time Julius Caesar invaded Gaul, two-thirds of current French territory were already somewhat Romanized. By then, it had been an ongoing process for the last century and a half. There is a reason why the Gauls turned into Gallo-Romans in less than half a century, one of the quickest foreign assimilation in history. So this image of brutal, uncultured, and dirty barbarians that lived in the forest is just absurd. Take La Moustache à la Gauloise, which every good Gaul wore, whether it's Asterix or 19th century paintings, right? Well, it depends on who, when, and where. After all, they did live for a thousand years. You don't dress or groom like your parents or grandparents did, right? It is likely that nobles once wore a moustache, as Diodorus Sicilius mentions, but it seemed out of fashion by the time Caesar invaded, since in Commentary de Bello Gallico, he only mentions such grooming on the Britons, who, much like today, were always kind of backwards. All in all, the moustache fails to show up in much art, such as these coins minted during that time by the Veneti and the Parisi, which shows not only moustacheless man, but clean and brushed hair. Clean and brushed? But their hair was long and rough, like this Roman coin of Vercingetorix proves. Well, not necessarily, because when that coin was minted, he had already been a prisoner for four years. And excuse him for not being on his A game while rotting in a cell. In fact, much like Frenchmen today, Celtic nobles took a lot of care of their appearance. They had to. The Druids forbid them from writing and from representing their gods. As such, most of their artistic expressions were done on themselves, which meant maintaining perfect appearance and physical condition, cleaning, brushing, and dyeing their hair, or wearing elaborate jewelries and clothes. After all, it is the Gauls that invented les brogues, shoes, and les brés, pants. And they could invent all this because far from being uneducated and unrefined, they were wonderful artisans. They invented the wooden barrel, the iron plow, possibly the chainmail, hammers, and even fat-based soap, which is the reason why you don't clean yourself by scrapping off olive oil. Dirty people, right? To take care of their luscious hair, they forged many tools, hairbrushes, mirrors, scissors, and more. As I've said before, they were wonderful artisans, especially when it came to metalwork, not just for tools, but also refined jewelry, such as torques or fibulas made of gold, silver, and bronze. The Romans acknowledged the quality of these goods by trading them in mass for wine. Because yes, they didn't just drink ale either, they were very fond of wine. Nor did they eat boar during banquets all the time. Meat was quite rare, as it would be for most until industrial production, and so diets were mostly made of grains. 
This stereotype probably comes from their image of living in the forest and being one with nature. But this couldn't be any further from the truth. While some places were sacred, such as the Carnutes forest, the ghouls turned actors of forest into farmland and pastures. And as for most of history, hunting was a noble sport. But that doesn't mean they all lived in small villages made of wood and stone with a weak wooden palisade either. They had large urban centers such as Alesia or Gergovia called Opida, usually on top of hills with stone fortifications. Their homes weren't made of wood or stone, but dub, a mixture of clay, sand, and straw. But these towns, of course, were defended by soldiers with winged helmets, right? Nope. That is probably one of the stupidest Gallic myths. Really? Wings on helmets? My friend at Mercenary Camp did a video on why horns on helmets make no sense. The same applies to wings. The myth probably comes from their retractable chick pieces that looked like wings. This helmet design, by the way, would come to inspire the Roman imperial helmet. And finally, it's tough to say, but as cool as it looks, Gallic chiefs never stood on shields. This is completely anachronistic, since it was a practice done by the Franks, a Germanic tribe, much later. In fact, the Gauls didn't even use round shields, but more oval, rectangular shaped. To be fair, I don't blame you if some of these came as a surprise. It surprised me too. As most, my ideas of the goals had stopped along with Asterix and Obelix. It doesn't help that similar images are found in most paintings, statues, or even textbooks depicting them. But cells are a fascinating part of European history. And while I don't expect most to have the time, nor desire to care about them, I think the least we can do is to stop depicting them in such a degrading and caricatural way. Hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed this video. While I was gone, my channel grew massively, which was a wonderful surprise. So I'd like to thank everyone who've come aboard. We've reached 75 subs, and that's just wild to be honest. So if you want to keep supporting the channel, make sure to leave a like, comment, share, and if you haven't yet, subscribe. This was Barris. I will see you next week. But until then, merde.